how do we achieve solid improvement when it comes to positional chess, to strategy? Well, guys, the same way that we improve when it comes to tactics. How did you get better at finding forks? You did hundreds of forks. Strategy, it is the same thing. It's not enough to just see someone making a video like this one. You need to reinforce it, reinforce it. Those of you who have been with me from the beginning, you should know why this move that the black pieces just played, D takes E4, it has strategic positional drawbacks. And you should be able to come up with a plan that is going to guide you through the remaining of the game. Now, if you saw our latest lesson about these two principles, accumulate and convert by applying the principle of simplification, you should also have it easier to come up with that plan. Now, even though the critical moment, one of the critical mo moments in the game is right here after knight f6, let's go back and let's talk about what happened after Capablanca played e4, e6, French defense, and then D takes e4. Guys, already there are strategic concessions being made here by the black pieces. This is known to be pretty solid for black, but the problem is that after knight, after D takes e4, e5, guys, is going to become a pretty nice square for the white pieces. What am I going to do? Well, knight f3, knight e5, and one of the reasons why this is so powerful is because it is on a semi-open file. And I know that those of you who already went over lesson 52, you're going to be saying, okay, but this is not really a weak square because this pawn could kick you out any moment. Well, that is true. But again, since this pawn is on a semi-open file, if they ever play f6 to either prevent me from landing on e5 or to kick me out, e6 is going to become weak. And again, my rook is going to be there to put pressure. So it's not a big deal if you play f6, and the white pieces had a pawn on the E file. But since that file is semi-open, then it is going to be pretty, pretty annoying. So knight D7 was played, knight F3, knight F6, and then after knight takes F6, guys, this is extremely important. I'm going to, at the risk of making it confusing, I'm gonna flip the board, and I want you to look at it, to pause the video if you need to, and think, what would you play if you were the black pieces? Well, of course, queen f6 is out of the picture. Bishop g5, it just doesn't make sense. But what to do, g takes f6 or knight takes f6. Now, in this game, knight f6 was played. It makes sense, keeping the pawn structure healthy. But I can tell you from experience, guys, sometimes it is better to mess up your pawn structure, double pawns, isolated pawn, and get some counterplay. When we talked about doubled pawns, we talked about the benefits. And one of them is semi-open file. You also get more control with the center. So this is preferable to get some counterplay than keeping the pawn structure healthy and allow your opponent to attack knight e5, then queen comes to f3, and then you just take it in passively. This is so annoying. So instead, I would just take with the pawn and look for that counter play okay now in this game let me flip the board they played knight f6 knight f6 and immediately capablanca put the knight on e5 and yes i know a lot of you're gonna be asking okay but isn't he moving the same piece twice in the opening and this is only move number number seven well yes but in this case it is justified guys not only am i pu putting the knight on a powerful square true there's no rush but the thing is that there's something else guys this move is making it difficult for my opponent to develop easily. For example, this bishop, it needs to be developed. If they try to do b6, well, I got bishop b5 coming in thanks to the knight, queen f3 also pretty annoying, and this is just the idea. It makes sense to place it on e5 this quickly, right? So knight e5 was played, bishop d6. At this point, many of us, we just freak out a little bit because we're like, oh man, we put the knight there two turns, to get the knight to e5, they're going to chop it off. And this is also very important. Whenever you move the same piece multiple times and then you end up trading it, those multiple moves, it's like you threw them away, right? It, they disappeared. So that's one of the concerns. However, in this case, they're giving us their good bishop. This is the bishop that is not blocked by their central pawns. And we already talked about how important the pearl bishops is. So if they actually give me this good bishop, I'm going to be keeping the pearl bishops myself. So queen f3 was played, c6, and this move, guys, this is another fatal 
strategic mistake. You're only making this bishop worse and worse. And also the dark squares become weaker, which means this bishop is extremely important for the black pieces. They should never let go of this bishop. With the pawns gone, then, or with the pawns only controlling light squares, the bishop is the only one in charge of controlling those. If that bishop is gone, then they need the queen to take, take over that role, right? So after c3, castle, bishop g5, just developing, pinning the knight, notice how the bishop had to go back to e7. Now, this is already looking bad for black. All of us know the white pieces should have the initiative. It should be easier to play as white. Now, bishop e7, fine. Bishop d3. Now, knight e8. And for the black pieces, they are releasing this pressure. For the white pieces, guys, now we start applying phase two. See, we're reinforcing what we talked about last time. If you heard it last time, you probably went on to do something else. You forgot about it. You've seen it now again. We accumulated small strategic advantages. Now we're going to get rid of whatever we don't need by applying the rule of simplification. What is it that we don't need? Well, I wish I could remove these bishops. And again, it's not about what you take. It's about what's left. So I want to leave them with this bad bishop. So these two, it makes sense. I want to remove that good bishop. However, before going for it, Capablanca played a, in my opinion, is a genius move. Queen h3, threatening checkmate. And of course, it could be easily stopped by f5. But guys, what changed? Every time a pawn is moved in chess, weaknesses are created. So now with this f5, yes, there's no checkmate threat anymore, but this is forever a left behind backward pawn. And e5 is now officially a weak square. So those of you who went over lesson 52, here you have it. And you should know the knight in itself is not enough to win the game. You should know what to do after to convert that advantage. Now, after f5, again, now we trade. That good bishop is gone for, for black. We castle. And guys, this position strategically makes a lot of sense. It's very easy to play this as white. Now, rook f6 was played. The white pieces, Capablanca style, very simple chess. Rook on the semi-open file. Knight d6. I'm going to double up my rooks. And just like this, all of my pieces are active. c4, knight f7. And here they're trying to give back some material. But Capablanca said, you know what? Instead of knight d7 and then ideas with bishop f5, that's not going to be sufficient. I don't want to allow you to get activity. And that's very important. When we talked about how to play against the isolated queen pawn, we said, be careful because sometimes we don't want to take the pawn. We just want our opponent's pieces to be cramped and defensive. But instead, Capablanca knows that the last thing he wants is to get rid of that bishop, especially if you trade it for the knight. It's not enough, guys. It's not sufficient to get a pawn for that, okay? So instead, he said, my pieces are so active. When your pieces are active, you need to find opportunities to attack. And what did he play? Well, the strong d5 move, guys. What are we looking for? Well, in this game, they played knight takes e5, and we continue to drill down that file also we keep look bishop is better than the other bishop rooks are better than their rooks and our queen is better than this queen right so we keep that but the alternative was for them to take on d5 we take back and of course forget about taking now because we have knight d7 now this is really dangerous but also bishop c4 is now going to be available and guys that's the end of the game right so Instead of taking knight e5, rook e5, g6, queen h4, very nice how the queen is getting activated. Same principle, I know, I know that I've said it so many times, but here it makes sense because the dark squares are weak. Look at this, all pawns on the light squares, that means dark squares are weak. But also, I have one bishop left. Well, my queen needs to be on the opposite color so that they complement each other. I'm missing the dark square bishop. The queen takes over. But here, of course, there's something deeper, which is after king g7, look at this nice transition to the center with the queen. Trying to just kill him through that diagonal. They played c5. They have to. I'm threatening to take on a7. I'm threatening to take on e6 and just punish them with that pin. So c5, queen c3, pawn b6. And here, they don't even care if Capablanca takes this pawn. Again, notice that this is pinned. 
So you could take on e6. And again, from the defensive side, many times it's a good idea to, instead of being passive, taking it in, just giving the pawn so that they have to be the ones defending that isolated pawn. Something to keep in mind. Now, d takes e6, bishop goes back. And guys, this is one of the positions I showed you at the beginning. For me, this was the difficult part in the game, the one that was not so obvious, and it should be, okay? Now, the way to go about it is I got the powerful pawn. My rooks are as good as they could be. This queen, don't even talk about it. But my bishop is not on the best square it could be. And this goes back to what I keep telling you. Whenever you get to a moment in the game that you're like, you know what? I don't really know what to do now. I always tell you, think of which of your pieces can you improve? And in this case, it is the bishop. The question to ask is, if this bishop were floating in the air, where would I put it? Well, we have to agree that d5 is the best square. So what did he play? Bishop e2, then bishop takes e6, bishop f3, and this pin is just too much. Actually, these pins are just too much. So king f7, bishop d5, the pin, queen d6, queen e3. This is, uh, is this Alekhine or Alekhine? It's gone. I think so. Rook e7 was played. And now, guys, look, remember that queen that went from king side to queen side uh, or to the center, to the queen side, then back around? Well, that's it. Now we're starting to just go h4 and h5. This, here we also see a little bit of the principle of the second weakness, lesson 101, which is if you're putting pressure already on a weakness, they could easily defend it. But if you create a second weakness, they just cannot take care of the two, right? So king g8, h4, a6. Look at this. This is so sad. This move has nothing to do with anything else, guys. Definitely. So h5 was played. Then pawn to f4. h takes g6. h takes g6. And now see if you can find the final move that made the black pieces resign. Well, of course, we got rook takes e6 giving up the exchange only because we know that after the rook takes that rook is going to be pinned so we take and then we collect on e6 so there you have it guys we keep reinforcing we keep drilling just like we've done with tactics that's the only way to make these strategic ideas stick and they become second nature to you that way with that said let me know in the comments what you thought and i will see you in our next lesson